everybody. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Gregorian. I'm the president and CEO of the Detroit Economic Club. Welcome to today's meeting in person and not on Zoom. Yay. And because we're not on Zoom, I want to assure you, because you can't see behind the podium, that Stu, Rick, and I are wearing pants today. Especially want to welcome our DEC members. And if you're not a DEC member yet, please allow me 10 seconds to myth bust. There's no application or requirement to become a DEC member. No nomination process, no job level, no salary requirement. We just want people who want to build their networks and hear from thought leaders like the ones that you'll see on stage today. You can sign up to become a member easily at econclub.org. And as we get started, I would just ask you to uh, kindly silence your cell phone so we do not disturb the program. And you may remember, we're all a bit rusty, but one of the many traditions at DEC meetings is we always begin by honoring our country with the Pledge of Allegiance. So I would ask you to stand and join me. The flag is directly behind me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And kindly remain standing as our invocation today will be delivered by Deacon Joseph Adams from Hartford Memorial Baptist Church. And it is so nice to see you again. Thank you. Shall we pray? Almighty God, we ask your blessings on this meeting today. Bless the information that will be, that will be shared. We pray for our guidance as we travel through troubling times. Let not mercy and truth be forsaken. Help us to realize that the truth will set us free. I saw the other day on TV two toddlers or youngsters, I guess it was a PSA, running towards each other. And when they reached each other, they embraced, full of joy. It is this caring and respect for one another that will bring peace to our lives and to this nation. Help us to realize we do have peaceful, differences, but we can resolve them by talking to one another. We are all the same, just different shades and different sizes. We ask that for us to understand that we have the opportunity to come together to save our democracy. Our birth certificate does not state that we are a Democrat or Republican, or that we are part of a red state or a blue state. It just says that we are citizens of the United States and we are Americans with rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We ask these blessings from you who have created us all, amen. Thank you for those thoughtful words, Deacon, and please be seated, everybody. We love having high school and college students with us at every one of our meetings, and these students are here courtesy of our generous corporate sponsors. Their morning already began with a private Q&A session with our speaker today. Let's just take a moment to let you know uh, which group of students are with us. We've got folks from, students from University of Prep, University Prep, thanks to General Motors, Hazel Park High School and Catholic Central brought to you today, thanks to Rick DeVore and PNC. Students from Advanced Tech Academy, thanks to the Ford Motor Company. Schoolcraft College, thanks Gabriel and Walsh College, who sponsored them today. Brother Ice Warriors, thanks to Kendra and uh, from Accenture. And Lake Orion Dragons, thanks to Sarah and Delta Dental. 
of Michigan. So please join me in a round of applause as we welcome our students and thank their sponsors. On your tables, a couple things. You'll see our season lineup. We're just getting started. It's going to be a mix of in-person and virtual as we slowly re-engage. Next up, some of our popular peer groups. Next week, October 13, it's our Money Talk series where we hear from investment managers on a subject near and dear to your hearts, your money. And our next in-person meeting will be October 29, when we'll be joined by the CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian, on the future of travel. So we hope you can be uh, here for that one too. Also on your table is our sponsor brochure. Please, please take a moment to check out the sponsors and patrons, patronize them if you can. We can never thank these organizations enough because they are the reason we can continue to bring programs like today's. If you are a tweeter, we want you to tweet today using at Debt Economic Club. And the DEC has an incredible history of speakers that tell the history of our country. Stuart, October 6th is a popular date in DEC's 87 year history. You, sir, now join a distinguished list of 10 other speakers with the first one in 1947 who graced our podium on this day, October 6th. A few quick highlights. 1952, the New York Stock Exchange president. 1980, David Rockefeller, chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank. 2003, with apologies to PA announcer Mason, we had Detroit Pistons president Joe Dumars at the podium. And more recently in 2015, U of M president Mark Schlissel. And today we're pleased to add you, Stu, as our 11th speaker on this day in DEC history and in the time flies category. This is your fifth appearance at the DEC, so congratulations and thanks for being with us again. <laughs> One of the more popular elements of our meetings is we want to hear from you at the end. Final 15, 20 minutes is a Q&A session. Stewart's agreed to answer your toughest questions and there's instructions on your tables how to submit those questions using an app. So go ahead and get those questions to us, and those questions will make their way to our presiding officer, who I'm about to put to work. Rick DeVore is the executive VP and regional president of Detroit and Southeast Michigan for PNC Financial Services Group. He's a board member of the DEC, a great friend of the DEC, and to me personally, and also a great supporter of many, many things in our community and state. And a huge thank you to Rick for bringing Stu to the DEC once again and supporting this event. So ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Rick DeVore. Thank you, Rick. So uh, contrary to any rumors, Stu was not the speaker in 1947. I just wanted to point out. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, like you said, I'm Rick DeVore, PNC Regional President. It's my pleasure, of course, to be presiding officer today, primarily because um, it's just an honor to introduce my good friend Stu Hoffman. We've been friends many years. and. Uh, 23 years or something like that. And, um, and it's funny, we neither one of us have gotten any older in that whole time. But uh, <laughs> Stu joined PNC in 1980 and was named chief economist in 1991. One of PNC's principal spokespersons on economic issues. I think a lot of you have probably seen him on, quoted in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, he's been in Bloomberg, CNBC, etc. Over the years, he's earned numerous awards, including being named the nation's most accurate forecaster by Business Week and one of the Wall Street Journal's top forecasters from 1988 to 2015. Speaking of accuracy, everyone who's followed Stu's forecasts over the years, and I think a lot of you are repeat attendees, is aware that he's been spot on for many things that are near and dear to our heart in Detroit, auto sales, jobs, and gas prices. I expect those are going to be some topics today. Stu uh, earned his graduate degree, uh, both his master's and his PhD from University of Cincinnati. He's all excited because his teams are ranked third and fourth or whatever. But uh, so he's pretty excited right now as both a Nittany Lion and also a graduate of University of Cincinnati. So without further ado, please welcome a guy that's a shoe in for Economist Hall of Fame, my friend Stuart Hoffman. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rick. Um, 
I like Rick's introduction, especially our good friendship going over many, many years. And I particularly like the fact that I don't have to adjust the microphone when I get up here after uh, he has, uh, he has introdu introduced me. Steve's already divulged that we're wearing pants. Uh, it is the first time I've worn long pants and, uh, and given a speech in quite a while. So uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And it, it is great that this is, as you said, your first time back and in person. And we met with a lot of great students before that. And, and many of your dignitaries, I had the chance to give you a, a few comments and get a lot of good questions from, uh, from the students that are here. And I think I got a few more that are coming in later through Rick. So it really is a pleasure and an honor to be here on this auspicious day, following in some of those great footsteps <clears throat> and uh, be back for my fifth time uh, to be able to speak to you. And I, I appreciate the offer. Uh, my position at PNC is I'm, I'm sort of an emeritus. I was the chief economist for many, many years. And uh, the last couple of years, like many of you, have been working from home, doing a lot of <clears throat> virtual presentations. So as I say, this is uh, it's a real treat. It really is nice to be able to look out and see faces and be able to have that you know, repertoire and, and rapport with one another. and uh, Hopefully this is a sign that we as a nation and us as business people and individuals are getting back <laughs> to being able to get together again to either do something boring like talk about economics or to do something exciting like uh, go to a Penn State football game. But, uh, but I did try to get tickets to Penn State, Michigan. They told me it was a, it sold out. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. But I, I, I'm, I'm not going to talk about anything controversial like that. Instead, I'm going to talk about the debt ceiling, something that is uh, <laughs> much less controversial and uh, something that, that we can all agree on. What I want to do is I want to you know, kind of organize my, my remarks into kind of three, three topics. First topic is where is this U.S. economy headed? Where do we think it's headed with all the challenges, financial, medical, global, uh, D.C., fiscal policy, Federal Reserve, lot, they're always, it's always challenging. And of course, the last couple of years have been extraordinarily so. So I want to, you know, give you our outlook for the economy, which I'd still say is a glass that's half full, not half empty. Talk about certainly the downside risk, but some of the upside potentials. <clears throat> the second thing I want to do is share with you a survey of small businesses that PNC did, we've been doing it for 18 years. I started it back, I think in, I guess it was 2003. And it's a survey we take of very, very, very small businesses. Do it twice a year. Some surveys are done monthly and there are all kinds of surveys. But what we liked about this and still do is we talked across the nation. I don't have Michigan or a particular region. That small businesses, like I'm sure many of you in this, in this room represent, you have less than 25 employees. Uh, your, your sales are maybe under 5 million. You've had all the challenge that everybody else has. I think of it as the grassroots of the American economy. It's not Ford or GM. It's not IBM. It's not PNC. It's not Apple. It's, it's the individual blades of grass that make up the U.S. economy. And across all industries, obviously services, retail, construction activity, manufacturers. And I can tell you in the 18 years, and then I'll give you a little more detail, in the 18 years that we've been doing this survey, when we asked these individuals how confident they felt about their business, what they could control, not what's going to happen in Washington or overseas or in China, but what do they think are the outlook for their sales, their profits, their hiring, their own business, looking, we always say, look out over the next six to nine months. And the results were the most optimistic that we've seen in the history of the survey. And I'll give you a little bit of information. And I think it supports our relatively half glass full, cautious, optimistic outlook for the US economy going forward. And then the last thing is I want to talk about the Detroit metropolitan area. Try to talk to you about, uh, you know, review some of the numbers. What's happened to jobs? That's primarily what I'm looking at. 
what's happened to jobs in, uh, of course, the spring of 2020 and the rebound since and how that compares to some of the national trends. So that's where we're going in 15 or 20 minutes. I know there are a lot of good questions out there that uh, I'll look forward to answering it as well. But as I mentioned, only half-heartedly, the debt ceiling. The biggest, I mean, COVID, of course, in some sense, is the biggest risk. Are we going to get another, you know, another Greek letter, <laughs> gamma, uh, uh, out there that is going to become more contagious than Delta? And are we going to have another setback? Are we going to get our school-age kids, at least sub-teenager kids, vaccinated, which I think would be a real, real uh, you know, help in that, and continue to have the vaccinations? And Merck having a drug that you know, can help you if you do get the disease from being uh, you know, sicker or need to be hospitalized. So on the medical front, on the scientific front, we've come a long way, and I think it's looking pretty positive. And hopefully the Delta cases have peaked. They seem to have in Michigan and around the country and are coming down. And even though the rate of vaccination has slowed dramatically, um, it's still positive. And I guess about, I think it's last I heard, it was about 65% of Americans uh, have gotten at least one vaccine, adult, uh, say over 12 that are eligible or over 11, um, have gotten vaccinations. Although that's still much lower than we see in, in a number of European countries or even in our our friends up north in, in Canada. So we have this debt ceiling. It's, you know, it's when the government has borrowed a lot of money. And a couple of years ago, whenever the last time, there was a ceiling that was set. And when the US Treasury gets to that amount, uh, it's over $20 trillion, I'm not exactly sure, they have to get congressional permission to borrow more. And of course, it's become a major political football. And Janet Yellen has said, and I think rightly so, if we are stupid enough, we are our elected officials, to default on the U.S. Treasury debt before the end of this month, uh, it, it would be a catastrophe for the U.S. economy and for the financial markets and, frankly, for the credit worthiness and the, you know, the reputation of the U.S. So I don't know how it's going to be resolved. I do know it was raised three times during the Trump administration, bipartisan. I do know this, the money has already been spent. This is not, well, we're gonna raise the debt ceiling so President Biden's uh, American Families Plan or the Infrastructure Plan, which was at least partly bipartisan, can get funded. This is, we already spent the money, and I'd say wisely, bipartisan on the CARES Act to combat the tremendous economic fallout that could have been a depression we were bordering on a depression, uh, say, 15, 18 months ago. I, I, I wouldn't want to stand up here and look at, uh, out what the economy would look like today or going forward if we hadn't had the CARES Act. That really was essential. And we hadn't had the Federal Reserve do the financial uh, things that it did to shore up the financial markets. And it was bipartisan, and it was absolutely necessary. The CARES Act was $2.5 trillion. Then there was another bill passed right before President Trump's term expired. I can't remember the name, but it, it sent out more checks and um, PPP loans. That was $900 billion. Then we had the American Rescue Plan that was passed by Biden, and that was $1.8 trillion. So yes, trillions of dollars. But it was money that was absolutely necessary to be spent in an economy that was cratering. Exactly the opposite of, frankly, what happened in the 1930s. In the early 1930s, the government, at the time, balanced the budget. Don't go into deficit spending, and we didn't know as much about economics as you know, we do now almost 90 years later. That was a bad prescription. You can't balance the budget when the economy's collapsing, especially for something like a pandemic that is you know, not in the normal result, like the, the housing bubble. It, it, it's, this was, a, was like, you know, like you said, it's like a hurricane or a storm. So we spent the money. And now we're up against the debt ceiling. And if we don't pass it, everything I tell you about my relatively positive outlook for the economy isn't going to come true. Because we, or at least our elected officials, if they don't pass it in default, we'll have shot ourselves in the foot. Or a better analogy might be have slit our throats or have shot ourselves in a more vulnerable part of our anatomy, somewhere between our foot and our throats, that uh, we don't really want to get uh, shot at. 
So my guess would be somehow, some way, th this will get passed. It'll be one of those last minute deals and I don't know, now the nuclear option, will they go to break the filibuster for this one issue? I'll leave the politics aside other than to say that yes, to me that even more than COVID is the most immediate economic threat to the well-being of the U.S. economy short run and I would argue long run and I hope that our elected officials will somehow figure out a way and if it has to be all partisan on the part of Democrats, so be it. If that happens, our outlook for the economy, of course, subject to what does happen with vaccinations and is there another variant uh, and, and do our kids, our school aid kids get vaccinated and how many more Americans, indeed globally. Uh, you know, clearly that's still, and we made a tremendous amount of progress, but anything I say about the future certainly has to depend on the course of the pandemic and whether it's improving and, or, or takes a turn for the worse. Uh, it appears to be improving in the sense that cases are going down and more and more people are being vaccinated. If that's the case, we think the outlook for the U.S. economy in these final couple of months of this year and throughout next year and hopefully in the next several years is some pretty solid economic growth. I have a PowerPoint that I'm not using, so I don't have a lot of numbers I'm going to throw at you. I'm going to try to paint more of a picture. In terms of GDP, our, our, our most comprehensive measure of the economy, which collapsed in the first half of 2020 by, I don't know, it was around 25%, <laughs> depression-like. But in the year following that, meaning from the middle of last year to the middle of this year, I would say almost miraculously, GDP regrew or gained back all of what it lost. And we're actually, when the numbers come out for the third quarter, they come out usually, I guess, a couple of weeks from now, we will be back to a new high level of economic growth pre-pandemic. But that's not true of the job market. Jobs have improved dramatically. We lost 22.3 million jobs in two months. That was basically one out of every seven people lost a job in March and April, or February, March, April of, I guess it was March and April, February at the peak of 2020. In the months since then, say from May when jobs started growing again through August, we had the latest data, we gained back about, uh, I guess it's about 17 million jobs. So somewhere around 70%, or a little under. So we still have a ways to go. And the unemployment rate is still much higher. And it's relatively higher for Afro-Americans compared to where it was, Hispanics, and still higher for whites than it was at around 3.5% or under 3 uh, back before the pandemic. Our forecast, if we're right, is at least by the middle of next year, we will finally get the five million jobs that were lost. Obviously not the same individuals, not the same industries, not the same regions, but in terms of broad aggregates, hopefully by the middle of next year, a year later than we got GDP back to the previous level, we'll at least get jobs back. And the unemployment rate by then should be somewhere, today it's 5.2%, today meaning August, by then hopefully it'll be below 4.5%. We think that there are gonna be, there's going to be more inflation. I'll talk a little about the Fed. We've seen a lot of inflation. The Fed's talked about it being transitory, but inflation has lasted longer. It's been higher. Chairman Powell, uh, of the Fed Chairman Powell, is, is sort of admitted it's probably going to be more inflation over in the next year than they thought, and the supply problems. I'm sure everyone in this room can tell me about how hard it is to get supplies and people, so sort of materials and people in your business. And that, in that small survey that I'll come to in a minute, one out of three, and I'm surprised it wasn't higher, said one of their biggest problems is retaining and finding qualified people to, to run their business. So we know there are problems, and certainly the auto industry is almost ground zero of the problems with not enough semiconductor chips, and auto sales fell again for the fourth straight month in, uh, I guess, in September, the data that just came out, because there just aren't any cars out there. I don't think it's a shortage of demand. I think there's plenty of people who want to buy new cars, but there are just not enough of them for sale. And admittedly, that's not going to clear, and that's probably part of the reason economic growth last quarter 
slowed a lot. We'll get that data in a few weeks. In addition, of course, to the rising Delta variant and a lot of pullbacks in the transportation, tourism, travel, restaurant business that occurred in August and into September, but now seems to be improving. We have some data we get. In this world, you get data every day. <laughs> And we, I follow data like from the TSA on how many people go through, you know, the airports. We have open uh, table, how many reservations are made. We have data from Google and Apple on mobility, how many people are walking, riding. Uh, just a wealth of data, of course, we never had very long ago that's very, very, very up to date. And so if you really want to get into the weeds, of course, those numbers look much worse in August and into early September and have started to improve, and we'll see if they continue, and not surprisingly, they're very much inversely correlated with the uh, number of cases. If you draw a picture of the number of cases, uh, hospitalizations, deaths from the COVID Delta variant, you know, it, it, it's a mirror image. And now that that started to come down, these are starting to come up. So I would say that despite the problem, and somebody just asked me here at the table, how long, you know, is it going to take? Well, I, I had thought three or four months ago, by the second half of this year, or by now, a lot of these problems would have worked their way out, but they haven't. Because of the, the ship shortage and the transport, uh, somebody also asked me, you know, fees to transport a lot of goods, particularly from the Far East, you know, are up sevenfold from what they were. Uh, and then once they get here, they got to get unloaded, and then they got to find a truck or a rail and get here. So there's probably going to be shortage of uh, lots of things around what I think will be a strong holiday season, but probably you want to buy early. And my wife has already told me there's a shortage of two carat diamond rings and that uh, <laughs> I, I need to get out there and buy one as quickly as possible. Uh, and uh, so I've, I've certainly taken her advice and I'm going out there. I'm, I couldn't find a two carat diamond ring, but what I did is I found 20 one-tenth of a carat diamond rings, and uh, I'm going to give her to that, and I'm going to try to glue them all together. You know, that's, that's, that, that's what super glue or, uh, is for, the, the little chips of diamonds. Uh, she'll never notice, I'm sure, if I glue them really, really carefully. But uh, it, it, it's going to be a tough season, more from a shortage. And we haven't lived through this probably since the 1970s. More inflation and shortage. Oil's at a record high. Um, and as, as I say, the auto industry. Uh, so, so that's going to hold the economy back. And I can't say as I have any clear vision or clairvoyance on how long it's going to take. It's both uh, getting rid of globally COVID so more people can go to work and manufacture and ship and then getting through these backlogs. And it's obviously taken longer than we thought. But despite that, I still think the economy's growth uh, in the final quarter of this year and over 22 and hopefully into 2023 will be above average. Where its average was around 2% for GDP. I think we'll double that. And jobs in a good year might have been two to two and a half million pre-pandemic. I think we'll more than double that. I think we're gonna get six or seven million jobs added to the economy. And so some of that scarcity of labor, uh, I, I think we'll be able to eat into some of that scarcity as we go through 2022 and 2023. So that's sort of our baseline point of view. And let me then give you a few highlights from our economic survey, which I found very comforting. You know, I kind of gave you the headline. We ask these businesses, you know, we do a stat we don't do it. We have a firm, so it's a statistically significant sample across the country, different industries. We've been doing it 18 years, so we have a long history. And when we ask these businesses, there are three or four things I think we're sharing with you. The first I already said, they're more optimistic about the outlook for their business over the coming six to nine months, meaning from August when we took the survey, so let's say through the middle of next year, than they have been in the history of the, uh, 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 of the survey. So I was surprised. We broke that down. We asked another question that relates to that. We asked how many of you have done anything to encourage your employees to get vaccinated. 80% said they had encouraged, and 50% said they made it mandatory. So, you know, these are smaller companies. I don't know the legality or whatever, but almost half of them made it mandatory. And when we asked them, give us the average, you think, of your employees that are vaccinated, 78%. So that's a pretty high number. And I can tell you those companies 
that said they were requiring vaccination and had higher levels of their employees vaccinated were much more optimistic <laughs> than those that didn't, although even those companies, since I've never broken it down that way in the past, but even those companies had a more optimistic outlook than is typical for our, our survey. So that's something about sort of the interplay between vaccinations and, and, and companies and, and their outlook for demand. They expect, of course, to raise prices. Another salient feature, more than we've seen, is their input costs are going up, labor, materials, or they're having shipping delays or paying more. And they said, look, we're going to pass that along more than we ever could. Over half said they're going to raise prices to try to maintain their profit margins or because the demand is strong enough that if they do, they're not going to lose it to a competitor. Note the Federal Reserve. <laughs> uh, there's, there's, there's going to be more inflation in that environment. So they are doing that, and uh, they still have a very positive point of view. One more that I thought was interesting, there are a number of things, was their attitude about where, how people are working. 42% said they had returned to work at the office. I know, obviously, if you're in construction or retailing or first responders, you know, you, you can't necessarily phone it in. So 42% said they were back, 17% said they were transitioning to get everyone back in the office. But that still leaves 40% of businesses that know the future is a hybrid world where, where it's possible, employees are gonna come in part of the time, work from home part of the time, and that's certainly a different world than it was pre-pandemic. I mean, you had part-time people and you had people that might take one day off a week and you try to accommodate them, PNC did that. Uh, but, you know, 40% of those companies, so clearly there's something that's fundamentally changed, but yet the productivity, we asked them about their productivity, and they said the worker productivity had gone up, and they had done very well, and that's also implicit in what I said earlier. If GDP output is at a record high, but that's with 5 million fewer people working, by definition, because output per person is actually per person hour, is what we call productivity. So productivity has gone up a lot since the pandemic, well, since the worst of the pandemic in last spring. Businesses have adapted, and these small businesses too said they have had to and they've had to adapt. So their adaptation was also part of the reason they were fairly optimistic. So I would say that that supports our generally positive point of view. Now, when we surveyed them, the debt ceiling issue wasn't, you know, front and center back then. Um, the Mer Merck hadn't announced that. The Delta variant was actually, the cases were going up. Uh, they hadn't, you know, during that month of August when we did them. So there's, a, you know, in, in the world I live in, the world we all live in, something changes every day. I checked my phone, you know, to see what was happening before, before I got up here just to see, uh, you know, if something had happened in, in Washington or what was happening in the markets, uh, you know, pretty much more of the same. So that is what you know, we think is a pretty positive point of view of the economy, and yet there are challenges. There are certainly challenges in supply issues and in inflation and in getting qualified people to work for you and dealing with the vaccinations or in dealing with COVID and will there be a term for the worse and new variants. You know, that's the world we all live in as individuals, as business people, as, you know, just as humans trying to get by day by day. So that is, though, I would sum it up by saying at a national level, supported by our small business survey, that the outlook is fairly promising. And I do think the demand for automobiles is very strong. And that when the cars can be produced again, and whether that's three months or six or nine, they're not going to sit around on the lots very long. <laughs> they're going to get sold as there's a backlog of buyers or sellers who are going to have more jobs, if I'm right, millions of more people are going to be employed, more people are going to be willing to drive, although some may be more willing to take public transportation if indeed COVID is less of a threat to us, and it's on a global scale, not just in the U.S. I mentioned, Rick mentioned gasoline prices. I'm not going to try to predict them. You know, gasoline is up to around 3.30 a gallon, national average, probably higher in Michigan, lower in Georgia. It's typically, you know, California, it's four bucks a gallon. So it varies by region, partly depending upon state taxes and obviously transportation costs. I'm a little surprised, in fact, I'm a lot surprised that oil's gotten this high. And I think it may be near peaking. 
That's one of my more, I don't know if it's controversial or at least more wishful thinking maybe, forecasts. OPEC is producing more. Uh, yes, the world is growing, but there is more production coming on. And so maybe we're near a peak. At, gasoline isn't going to $4 a gallon. Uh, maybe it's going to you know, peak here around three thirty-five, and then typically come off in the winter down to around $3, and maybe by next spring it'll be back up to three and a quarter, uh, maybe at most three fifty. So yes, those are prices that are higher, but we've seen higher, a lot higher. I don't think those are killer prices either for the auto industry or for the motorists of America if they have to pay three to three fifty a gallon uh, national average, and especially at a time the jobs are growing, wages are growing, and hopefully some of these supply shortages are clearing themselves. Because as I say, there's no, economists like to say, there's no, sh there's no cure for high prices like high prices. <laughs> That's the market working. You make the prices high, there's going to be incentive to produce more. And admittedly, right now, that's difficult to do. But over time, and used car prices keep going up, it's going to be in GM and Fords and Chryslers and everyone's incentives uh, to produce as many cars as they physically can to provide a what I think is a, a global shortage of uh, supply relative to demand for automobiles. Let me just say a few last words here about the metro area. I looked back and I wanted to you know, see what happened here. And I'll have to read some of the numbers. But basically, in March and April of last year, as the pandemic virtually shut down the economy, the Detroit metropolitan area, which has about just over 2 million people working, you lost one out of every four jobs. 25%, which was around 530 thousand jobs. The national number was bad, but not as bad. It was around 15%. So Detroit took it worse. And you can see that in manufacturing. You lost 40%. Four out of 10 jobs in manufacturing disappeared between February and April of 2020. Since then, though, you've gotten back about 80%. In terms of numbers, that was about 104,000 manufacturing jobs that went away. About 88,000 are back, obviously much worse than the U.S. Um, but since May, May through August, when jobs have been growing every month, and I think this Friday we're going to get a jobs, I know we're going to get a jobs report. I think it's going to be a much better number than August, which was a little disappointing at around 250. These are national. We won't get Detroit's for a couple of weeks later or any other metro area. But I think we're going to see a pretty good rise in jobs. We have 400,000. There's a private report that came out today that isn't always indicative, but it, it was over 500,000, close to 600,000. Hopefully that's you know, a, a good precursor that the official number that comes out from the government, much more comprehensive survey, will show a much better growth in jobs in September than we had in August. And as they say, we think it you know, keeps doing quite well from there. Well, in the period since May, uh, the Detroit metro area gained back about 77% of the jobs lost. That's a little over 400,000. Guess what? The U.S. did 76. So basically, Detroit had a much bigger drop in jobs in that two-month period as a percent, because that's got to do it, relative to the U.S. It's gotten back about what the U.S. is, so clearly it's still in a bigger hole uh, in terms of numbers of jobs down. And a lot of that is showing up in manufacturing. The unemployment rate peaked last April at 25%. In the U.S., it was 15 although I can tell you because of measurement issues, it was probably closer to 20% for the U.S., and it might have even been higher than 25% for the Detroit metro area. Detroit's down to 4% in August, although I think that's deceptively low, and I'll tell you why in a second here. The U.S. in August was 5.2. So, wow, Detroit's 4 and the U.S. is 5. Sounds good, but there's a little caveat there. And the caveat is that your labor force, the number of people who are either employed or looking for work took a bigger hit in the metropolitan area and has come back less. Uh, you were down uh, about 10% in your labor force. The national number was around 8%. And you've only come back less than half. So you're missing over 100,000 people who were working in February of 2020 
that are not working and not even looking for work, as best as the statistics can, can tell you, in August, uh, com you know, compared to, compared to, I guess, February of 2020. The U.S. lost about 8% of its labor force, and much more women than men, much more Afro-Americans and Hispanics than whites. That's where the disproportionate effect has been in this. And the U.S. has gained back about 64% of its labor force, U, uh, U.S. So two out of three are back, and Detroit is still a little under one, one out of two. That's one of the things that's holding back and why so many people are looking, you know, I need employees. We still have a lot of people who were working in February of 2020 that aren't working today. And disproportionately by gender, they're women, and disproportionately by race, they're either uh, African American or Hispanic although in all cases they're much higher than they were. If I'm right about the U.S. economy creating jobs next year at about a 4% pace, I don't see why, especially if some of the shortages in the, and the chips in the automobile industries are cleared up, Detroit can't match that. I'd be hard pressed to say you'll exceed it, so there's still some ground you won't be making up for. <clears throat> but our forecast is that the region should show job growth, pretty solid job growth, over the next year, year and a half, along with the national trend. And hopefully that labor force will come back. And that was the caveat I said. Your unemployment rate at 4.1, admittedly, is more because people are missing <laughs> than they're employed. They've just dropped out, so they're not in those statistics. If I adjusted that for the relatively greater number of people that dropped out in, in Michigan or in Detroit relative to the U.S., the number would be close to 5.5 percent, a little above the U.S. number. And for that number, might not go down much next year. But just to hold it in the low fours as your labor force climbs means people are getting jobs. So I guess I'd sit here and say, final note, that our forecast for the U.S. economy should be pretty well mirrored here in Michigan and in the Detroit metropolitan area. A pretty solid year of growth and jobs and output and obviously clearing up the, the supply chain disruptions is uh, a, a, an essential ingredient, and that may hold this area back in other manufacturing in the first half of next year. But I think the demand is building up that when the supply conditions uh, improve and get even closer to normal for the automobile industry, for the aerospace industry, for so many other industries, let alone transportation, tourism, that's more dependent upon you know getting uh, us all more comfortable with traveling as we deal with COVID or get somewhat past it, I think are all positives for the U.S. and the regional economy as we go through the rest of this year and in the next year and the year after. Final word on the Fed. The Fed has kept interest rates low. They have been doing quantitative easing, that's buying securities, $120 billion a month since March of 2020. Next month, the Fed will meet and announce it's no longer necessary to keep monetary policy in the ICU or that the economy's in the ICU. We're getting better. We don't need that type of extraordinary monetary accommodation, especially when inflation is worse than they thought. So don't be surprised if in early November, the Fed announces it will get from $120 billion a month to zero probably by next summer, June or July. That will maybe push rates up a little bit. I don't think they're going to raise interest rates, the rates that are near zero, Probably, we think, in, maybe in 2023, by the middle of the year, maybe sooner. But even though the Fed is going to be tapering, as they call it, uh, quantitative easing from $120 billion to zero, and maybe a year later raising rates, it'll be because the economy is getting better. It'll be a sign that that medicine, is fiscal med monetary medicine, is not needed and is actually, to me, like your doctor saying, you can get off your meds. You don't need your meds. You can taper back and eventually get off because you're in a much healthier state. So don't think of that as somehow a, a killer for the economy. Think of that as a sign of the improvement in the economy and the need for less monetary uh, medicine to get the economy healed again. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, as I say, glass half full, then half empty, but I've tried to point it out all the holes that could be in the bottom of the glass <laughs> that drain it uh, before, uh, before we ever get uh, our thirst quenched. But I thank you for the invitation. 
I know there are a number of good questions out there uh, that Rick has, so I'm going to conclude my remarks, prepared remarks. Rick, turn it over to you to ask me a bunch of good questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stu. Um, first question, and I think it's a really good one, maybe piggybacking on what you were talking about earlier. Obviously, we know the consumer is still the big dog in the economy. It's the holiday season coming up. What are you looking for in terms, obviously, we have shortages of everything and stuff in containers out in the ocean. What are the key metrics you're looking for to see if the holiday sales are going to be off? Yeah, you heard the question about holiday sales. And yeah, um, I guess key metrics to me will be still the job numbers and wages. I can tell you, uh, it's not a fun fact, but it's a fact. You all know, or maybe know, that on September 5th, a lot of the enhanced, what we quote, call enhanced unemployment uh, insurance benefits that were part of the CARES Act expired. They were extended back in February by the American Rescue Plan, but on September 5th, a lot of people who were getting unemployment insurance for a lot of different reasons and extra from the government ended. On, right before September 5th, 12 and a half million people were still collecting unemployment benefits. I can tell you it peaked at 32 million in, uh, in you know, probably April or, or, or May or June of 2020. But guess what? After September 5th and the latest data we have, seven and a half million people are no longer eligible for unemployment benefits. It went from 12 and a half down to five. So that is one sort of caveat or one, you know, are these people going to be in a position to be able to, you know, have a good holiday, pay their bills? I suspect that's why some of them are going to go back to work now that they don't have the unemployment benefits. But the good thing is I think the number of jobs we've already created and will continue to create and the wages that have gone up means it's going to be a, a good holiday season. So what are indicators? Certainly I want to continue to see Delta variant cases come down. As I mentioned, I watch TSA to see how many people board planes. If you want really short-term data, I want to see what consumer confidence, which has come down the last couple of months, contrary to our survey. I want to see if it rebounds University of Michigan, one of the prime measures of consumer confidence. They've been doing it for decades. That fell off the last couple of months, last couple of months meaning August and September. I want to see if that rebounds uh, in October, November. That'll be what I'm looking at in terms of trying to figure out, you know, how good the holiday sales will be. And then even within that, is, is there a shortage of demand or is there a shortage of supply if there is a shortfall in terms of the, the gain in sales for the, that we're looking for? So those are a couple of numbers we'll be looking at. Speaking of uh, Delta Variant, Delta Airlines CEO, next speaker, yep. thoughts for him uh, coming up here in a couple of weeks on the travel industry and where you see that going? Um, I think there's a strong demand out there. I mean, the numbers on TSA and uh, open table from a restaurant point of view, from hotel, motel uh, bookings started to get really good back in June, July, and then the Delta variant pushed it back in August and September, or early September. Now they seem to be getting better. He'll have much more data. He'll know exactly how many seats he filled. I can tell you he's going to have one kind of skinny ass in one of his seats this afternoon on his way back to Pittsburgh, but he probably probably isn't going to talk about that. But tell him I, I was glad to be there and, and get him back. Uh, so I, I think he's going to tell you the one. I think Delta is also the only one, though, that has not mandated vaccines, mandated vaccines, maybe being headquartered in Atlanta or Georgia. It's not a great place to mandate vaccines. Uh, although uh, I think they're also charging if you get Delta and you want health care, and you're not vaccinated, uh, not get Delta, you're not vaccinated, you might have to pay more for your health care premiums, which is a whole different uh, situation. But I guess I would tell him, and he'll probably tell you, that they expect better passenger traffic, better load factors, better profitability, and probably some hiring in what will be a reasonably good holiday season over the next couple of months, uh, certainly relative to last year. But also, doctors will tell you their biggest fear is what's going to happen after Thanksgiving and after Christmas, uh, you know, to our cases of COVID and how much of that's going to spread. But my, my guess would be he's going to tell you numbers are a lot better since uh, 
since September, and they're expecting a fairly decent uh, holiday season for for travel. And and you might hear the same thing if you had the president of United or Marriott Hotels or any people involved in the tourism and travel business. So I'm going to jump into the lightning round. Yeah. But <coughs> my first question on the lightning round is, who's going to be the next Fed chair? I think it'll be Powell. I know his, his odds have gone down a little bit. What's happened at the Fed in the last couple of weeks is unprecedented. Two presidents resigning because of at least the appearance uh, of conflict of interest, let alone that it might be deemed by the inspector general who's been charged by Powell to investigate it. Then the vice chair, <coughs> a guy named Clarida, great economist. He was um, appointed by Trump. His term expires on January 31st, so he was leaving anyway whether he'll stick it out or resign. That, that's heard Powell. We, we heard what, uh, you heard the re-endorsement he got from Senator Warren. He's a dangerous man. That's, if no, that's a good reason to reappoint him as any. But um, I, I, I think he's gonna get reappointed. If not, Lyle Brainerd, who's on the governor, who's on the board, and who was talked about as Treasury Secretary but didn't get the job that Janet Yellen did, uh, I'd still say Powell's the most likely person to be renominated. If not, his term will expire on, I think, February 2nd as chair. He still is a governor. You can be the governor. Your term as governor lasts longer than chair. So whether he would stick around if he's not reappointed as chair, he could. And there's one vacancy on the Board of Governors. There are seven members. Doesn't get the attention the Supreme Court gets, that's for sure. So the Fed is going to be refashioned. Uh, a new vice chair, a new chair for supervision and regulation, one vacancy filled, and we'll see who's gonna be uh, the next Fed chair, but I guess I'd still put my uh, money on Powell. All right, well, I'm a little rusty, but one of the great traditions for the Detroit Economic Club is this lightning round, so right. I'm gonna ask you some questions we haven't asked in the past. Your best sport when you were a kid and today? It clearly was not basketball. Yeah, Stu, this is lightning round. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> my best sport today is golf. My best sport as a kid uh, was uh, jacks. <laughs> you could get in trouble on this next one. What website do you visit most often? Uh, well, I, I, that's boring, but yeah, I, I visit CNBC and uh, Bloomberg and Politico and CNN. So that tells you a little bit about my political leanings and about the boring life that I lead. Your first paying job? Uh, bag boy at the, at the supermarket. And if you could have anybody in your backyard, any band that you could pick to play in your backyard, who would that band be? Well, I don't know who would be with them, but it'd have to be Sir Paul uh, coming, coming in with whomever he wanted to bring. If he wanted to bring Ringo, that would be fine. Uh, th that's okay with me, T, but Sir Paul and whoever else he's hanging around with at the time. Besides Detroit, favorite U.S. city to visit? <laughs> um, uh, I do like Orlando, at least if I can take my grandkids with me. And last advice you'd give your 25-year-old self? Yeah, I thought about that one. It's, the answer to that's pretty obvious. 25-year-old uh, self, that, was in, that would have been 1984. I'd have said, in six years, some crazy guy named Steve Jobs is going to have an IPO for a company by, called Apple. <laughs> buy, put all your money in it. <laughs> Mortgage the farm and buy Apple at the IPO in five years. Back to the future. <laughs> Thank you. Stu Hoffman, you are always a pleasure and always welcome back at the DEC. And please report back how your wife likes her 20 diamond rings. That'll be interesting to know. So thank you again for traveling to be with us. Rick DeVore, outstanding job as presiding officer. Thanks for your support of everything in our state and the Detroit Economic Club. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for coming out today. We hope to see you October 29th when we host the CEO of Delta Airlines at Bastion. On time every time, the meeting of the Detroit Economic Club is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.